Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Notion Databases tutorial. In today's video, I'm going to teach you everything that there is to know about Notion databases, even if you're a beginner. I'm breaking this video down into multiple chapters, so if you want to learn something specific about Notion databases, then you can go down to the description, look through the chapters, and find what it is that you need help with. I've got my water on deck. This is going to be a long day of filming, and I appreciate you for checking out this video in particular. And if this video helps you out, I'd appreciate if you like this video because this took a ton of work, a ton of research, and it took me three years of figuring this out kind of on my own to be able to be in a position now where I can actually teach this in a way that makes sense to beginners. So what would you use a Notion database for? When I was a beginner, I didn't even know why I would use a Notion database. In fact, if you go look back at my oldest Notion videos, you'll find that I really wasn't using databases all that much. And then as I started learning about databases, my Notion workspaces got better and better. So out of the box, Notion is pretty functional and it works pretty well. But when you want to start creating complex setups in Notion, that's where databases come in. Databases can be good for collecting and categorizing information. For example, if you had a list of books or movies that you wanted to review and you wanted to store those in a way that you could come back later and search them based on how many stars you gave it or based on a keyword or based on a director or even a genre, you could do so. So it's a really good way to categorize different things and then give them different attributes to make these things more searchable and to categorize them better. The next thing that you can use Notion for is project and task management. So whether you're a large organization or just an individual, Notion databases can be a great way to organize your tasks into different projects and different statuses and then create views that allow you to see those tasks in a new light. The next way that you can use Notion is to organize your notes. You could create a Notion database for all of your notes and then sort them out based on different tags that you have in those notes. You can sort them by date, by author, by source, if you have a source that you're reading from when you're creating that note. And I've been using Notion as my personal knowledge management system or my note-taking system for about three years now. And finally, one of the most exciting ways that you can use Notion databases is to actually connect your databases together. So if you have a tasks database and a notes database, you can bring those together and make connections between individual tasks and individual notes. So if I have a task to complete a website and I have a note over here on how to build a website, I could relate those together so that when I'm focusing on that task of building a website, I could reference my note on how to do so. This is just scratching the surface with what's possible with Notion databases, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea as to how you can use databases in Notion. Next, let's jump into my computer and look at some of the foundational steps to building Notion databases, and then we'll work our way up to the more advanced steps when it comes to building more robust systems in Notion. So if I click into this empty page here and I hit the slash command, and then I start typing database, you'll see that there's tons of options that come up and this can get quite confusing. The three main ones that we're gonna wanna focus on in this tutorial are database inline, database full page, and linked view of database. The rest of these are honestly quite redundant and there's other ways of accessing these types of databases without needing to have all of these in this command. I'm gonna start out by clicking on the first option, database inline. When I do that, it's going to create a new database and it prompts me to give it a name. So I'm gonna call it books and here I can change the name column to book because that's what this database is about and I can enter the names of some books. I can also change the name of this database view by clicking on table right here, hitting rename and calling this view books. And I can hit enter. And now we have a books database. Inline databases work fine, but I recommend creating full page databases to stay more organized. To create a full page database, there's a few ways you can do this. The first way is just to hit slash and then type in full page and you'll see full page database. You can click on it. Whoa, it just took us to an entirely new page. That's because it created an entire page based on this new database. And 
the title of this page is going to serve as the title of your database. So if I wanted to call this one movies, I could do so. And similar to the other inline database, I could add a name here for movie and we could write some movies in here. I could also click on the view and rename it to movies table and then hit enter. You'll notice that there's some breadcrumbs that have appeared up here. So if I click on this untitled here, it's going to bring me back to that original page. Now I'm just going to name this books. And as you can see, we now have an inline database within a books page, but that also has a movies page within it. So if I click on movies, now we're in our movies database. This can get quite confusing because now we have a books page that's holding a movies page and an inline books database. This is why I tend to stay away from inline databases and I tend to just create a page for each database using the full page database feature. Let's get a little bit more organized here. What I can do is actually click on this inline database and I can turn it into a page. So I'm gonna hit turn into page and now we have a books page. If I click on it, you'll notice that it turned it into a full page database. I can go back to books and I can rename this page to databases. Now this is a whole lot more organized because now we have a page for all of our database pages and we can click into books and see our books and we can click into movies and see our movies. There's nothing else on these pages and they're dedicated to that single database. So now that we have this databases page, I'm just going to add an icon and I'm going to type in database. You can change the color here and I'm going to select this database icon. So now over in my left hand side here, I can see my databases page and that's going to contain each one of my full page databases. You can also add an icon for these. And that looks a whole lot nicer and a whole lot more organized. Next, let's say that we wanted to reference these side by side. We wanted to see them both together. So what I could do is I could create another page over here using my side panel and I could call it media library, for instance. And if I click into empty space here, hit the slash button and then start typing create, you'll see that it pulls up the option linked view of database. We're gonna click on that and then it's going to ask us which data source we want to reference. So we have movies and books, the two databases that we've created so far. Let's say I wanted to access the movies database. I could hit movies and now it's going to pull in that movies database. Next, I could go down to an empty space here, hit slash, do this once again by typing linked this time. So you can do create or you can do linked to get this option and then click on it and let's add books as well. So now we have a page that has our movies and our books and we also have a page to sort all of our databases. So this is my workflow when I'm creating new databases is basically to just create full page databases and sort them into their own databases page. And then from there, I can reference them in unique ways and I can create Notion workspaces out of those databases without having to use inline databases. Next, let's look at database properties. The first property that we want to look at is the text property. And this is one of the most basic properties that you can create you can click this plus button inside of your database and hit text. And that's going to allow you to create this text column. I'm just gonna call it summary. And here I can actually just type out a summary for my movie in this case. So let's enter a summary for La La Land. And again, you can pull between these columns like so. I can even right click on this column and turn off the wrap column option if I just want this to disappear like this and just get a brief preview of it. But I'm going to keep wrap column on just so we can see the entire summary and I'm just gonna drag this out a bit. Now I have some summaries here in my movies database and I can actually edit this through this linked view or I can go back to my databases page into movies and I can edit it alone on this isolated databases page. Next, I'm going to show you the numbers property. The numbers property is similar to the text property in Notion. So if I was looking at my movies database here and I wanted to add a runtime for these movies so that I know how long they are, I could add a property of number 
and I could name this runtime and then in parentheses, I will put minutes. Then I can click out of this and now I can enter the amount of minutes each of these movies is. The next property to look at is the select property. And this allows you to select one option from a drop down list of all of the options that you've added in the past for that database. So it would make sense in my movies database to add a genres select tab. So I'm going to hit select. I'm going to name it genre. And within here, I can enter the genre for each of these movies. So La La Land, I would type in musical and hit enter. And now if I click into this next one for Great Gatsby, it's going to show that we have musical in here, but I can also add a new one. Let's add drama. And then for Godfather, let's add another one of crime. And as you can see, it only lets us select one genre with this option. And you can also change the color of these options. So for musical, you could make it gray for drama. We could make it brown and for crime, we could make it orange or to keep your databases clean. If it doesn't matter what color they are, I recommend just making all of them gray. I like that look a little bit better personally, but that's just me. Next, we have the multi select property and the multi select property lets you do the same thing as the select property, except this one allows you to select multiple options. If I wanted to add a multi select property in my movies database, it would make sense to do this for something like actors. So I could list all of the different actors in these movies and then I could reference those for other movies in the future. So I'm just going to hit plus go to multi select and I'm going to name this actors and then I can add the main cast. So I'll type in Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. And what you could do here if you wanted is you could have for the actors, you could go blue for instance, and then for the actresses, you could go pink. That's just a suggestion. And this is a scenario where color would make sense to use for your different multi-select options. Now let's add actors for the rest of these options. Now in the future, if I wanted to reference these actors again, I could do so. I could just hit new, type in the name of the movie. I could add a summary here, which I'm not going to do right now. I could add the runtime, whatever the runtime is. We could enter a genre like we did before. And then here I could type in Leo. And as you can see, Leonardo DiCaprio comes up and I can reference that actor once again. Next, we have the status property and the status property is really good at showing what stage of a project something is at. And this is typically something that you would use for tasks, but it works well in our movies database example as well. Imagine we wanted to have a status for all of these movies so that we could see what we've watched and what we still need to watch. So I would hit the plus button. I'd click status and I'm just gonna leave the name as status. And then here we can select the different stages of these movies. So not started, we could rename to not watched, or we could name it wish list. That's on our wish list to watch it. And I'm gonna make that yellow. Actually, it probably makes more sense to call it watch list. Then we could have a status for in progress of watching, and we can even add a little emoji in here if we want. And then finally for the complete option, we can add watched. And within these different stages of to do, in progress and complete, we can add other types of statuses. So for complete, we could also add an archive. So these could be some things that were on our list before, but we didn't watch them and we just wanted to move them to an archive because they're no longer on our watch list and we wanted to check it off the list, but we didn't watch it, so it's archived. I'm sure you could get creative and come up with some different ways to use these statuses. And then once they are all added, I can come in here and change the status of these. Obviously, I can only be watching one thing at a time. I can also mark what I've already watched and what's on my watch list, as you can see. And if you ever wanna edit this property, you can just click on it, hit edit property, and you can come in here and add more statuses as you please. Next up, we have the date property and the date property does just that. It allows you to add dates to your database items. So for example, if we wanted to add the release date of these movies in our movies database, I could just hit the plus button, select the date property, 
and I could name it release date. You can change some of the options here like date format and time format between 12 hour and 24 hour. If I click into one of these date cells, you'll see that it pops up this calendar view where I can select a date or I can just type my date in up here. It's important to note that you can also add an end date and that will create two dates within this property so that you can have a beginning and an end. This isn't necessary for the release date example. You can also include time, which also isn't necessary, but I just wanted to note that you can add those. And there's also this remind feature. So if I set my date for the fifth, I could set it to remind me on the day of the event at 9 a.m., one day before the event at 9 a.m., which is already in the past, two days before the event at 9 a.m., which is in the past, and one week before the event, which is in the past. So again, you wouldn't use the remind feature for this release date example. I just wanted to show you that it was possible to use these, and hopefully you can get creative and think of some other ways that you can use the date property. Now I'm going to fill out these release dates. Now we have a list of release dates for all the movies in our movie database. Next up, we have the person property. The person property allows you to tag a person within your Notion database. So to add that, you just hit the plus button and you'd click person. And it doesn't really make sense to add it to this movies database, but I'm just showing you as an example here, you can set a limit for how many people you're allowed to add. I'm just gonna set it to a one person limit so that I can only add one person. But if you leave it at no limit, it's going to allow you to add as many people as you want right here. Let's change it to one and click into this area here. And because I'm the only one within this Notion workspace, I'm the only person that's going to show up. So I guess I could name this owner and I could add myself for these movies. Our database is getting filled up with tons of different properties and it's starting to get a little bit overwhelming. So now I'm going to show you how to organize your properties within your Notion database. Right now we're in the movies table view and I'm going to show you how to incorporate other views of this database soon. What we can do if this is getting a bit overwhelming and we only need to see certain properties right now is we can right click on the property we don't want to see and we can hit hide in view. This property is still part of the database. It's not deleted, it's just hidden right now. If we wanna bring it back, we can click on these three dots right here, go to properties. And as you can see, we have all of our hidden properties down here. I can just click this eye toggle to bring it back. And then I can always right click it to hide in view again. You can also hide properties by going to the three dots, going to properties, and then selecting the eyeball that you want to hide here. The only one that you can't hide is the page property here. So let's say we wanted to hide the status and the release date. And now we just have some nice basic information here. As you can see, these summaries get quite long. And if you want to be able to read them, it's nice that it wraps. But if you don't want to have these huge database items, then you can right click on summary and you can turn wrap column off. And that's going to make it so that it doesn't wrap the column. If I go between two database properties and I double click, it's going to downsize to the length of the longest item. I could also do this for actors here and let's do it for minutes as well. Now my database is organized a bit better. The next property to showcase is files and media. You can add a files and media property by clicking this plus button here and going to files and media. Files and media is pretty straightforward. It allows you to attach files to a database item by clicking into this empty space, and then you can choose to upload a file or you can embed a link. So if you have a PDF that you wanted to relate to a specific database item, you could either upload it here from your computer or you could link to it if it's in your Google Drive or something like that. It's important to note that if you are uploading files in Notion, the max size is five megabytes per file unless you upgrade to the plus plan. Notion can be okay for file storage, but personally, I tend to just keep my files in Google Drive or I just store them locally. And then if I really need to put something in Notion, then I will. But to be honest, Notion's strong suit definitely isn't storing files. I tend to leave that to tools like Google Drive, Dropbox, or I just locally store my files. So I'm going to delete files and media because we don't need it for this database. Next, we have the checkbox property. And the checkbox property is fairly simple. It allows you to mark something as either true or false, essentially. And it has a little checkbox that you can visually see. 
to add the checkbox property, you just hit plus, hit checkbox, and you can give it a name. So I'm actually gonna name this for my movies database, favorite. So that if I check these, I can now check my favorite movies so that I know those are my favorites. The nice thing about the checkbox property is you can always downsize this all the way down to just the checkbox. So if you wanted to have this be complete and you weren't using something like that statuses property that I already showed you in this video, and you just wanted to have complete or incomplete, then you could use it for something like this too. But in this case, I'm just going to leave it at favorite and you can change the icon here as well to a heart if it makes sense. Next up, we have the URL property and the URL property makes it possible to add a link to one of our database items. To add a URL, you just hit the plus button and then you go down to URL. And let's say in this movies database, I wanted to link to the IMDB page for each of these movies. So I would just type in IMDB and then I could just paste the link for the La La Land IMDB here so that if I ever wanted to go check it out, I could click on it and it would open that page. If you wanted to relate your Notion database items to a phone number or an email, this is possible as well. Just click the plus button in your database and there's an email or phone number option. And these are pretty self-explanatory. You can either do email and you can type in an email format here, or you could go ahead and add a phone property and type in a phone. Once these properties are in here, you can click on this link here to send an email, or you can click on this link to call. And since Notion works on your phone, you could create a database that's essentially a CRM with all of your contacts in it. And then if you wanted to call somebody directly from there, you could do that by opening up Notion on your phone and hitting the call button. So we've gone over quite a few properties that you can add to your databases. But so far we haven't gone over formulas, relations, rollups, created time, created by, last edited time, and last edited by. I'm going to skip over formula, relation, and rollup and go to these four for now. Now the options down here, created time, created by, last edited time, and last edited by, are automated options. So if I hit created time, it's just going to automatically add a property for the time that this was created. Same with created by, it's just going to add created by Carter Sirach because I'm the one who created this database item. And same goes for last edited time and last edited by. I'm going to delete these properties because they aren't necessary to have in this database. We'll come back to formulas, relations, and rollups a little bit later. Next, I'm gonna go over pages within your databases and how to create page templates for your database. Let me show you what I'm talking about and how this can be useful to you. So as I stated earlier in this video, each of these database rows has its own page right here. So if I hit open on La La Land, as you can see, all of my properties show up right here. Once you're in here, you can click and drag to rearrange the order of these properties. And you can even click on certain properties and you can choose between always hide or just to hide when it's empty. So I'm just gonna make it always hide since phone isn't relevant for this particular page. And if you wanna view any hidden properties, you can open them up right here. So I'm just going to rearrange things a bit here. Let's hide email, let's keep actors. Let's put favorite at the top so we can easily select that. Let's put genre up here as well. If we want to, we can also start entering content right within this page. So I can add bullet points and list things out. I could just simply write something. I could add an image by hitting slash and typing image. I could go to unsplash. So there we go. Now we have an image that has to do with La La Land. So you can do all sorts of things within this page to customize this particular page for La La Land. And if I open up the next page here for Great Gatsby, as you can see, it's empty right now to start. Now let's imagine for our movie pages that we wanted to create a default template that allows us to leave a quick review for that movie within the page. Let me show you what I mean. Now, if I wanted to add a template page that sets a default template for any new movies that I add to the database, I could click on this drop down here where it says new and I can hit new template. From here, it'll say you're editing a template in movies and I'm just gonna call this template new movie. 
And as you can see, we can set a default to watch list so that it automatically goes onto our watch list or whatever we want the default to be. And then within here, we could add some headings. So I could hit slash and type heading three and hit enter. And now I'm just going to type general review. So now that it says general review in the future, I'll be able to come in here and write a review underneath general review. I could add as many other headings in here or prompts as I want so that I can just focus on reviewing the movie and I don't have to worry about adding all of these prompts every single time I add a new movie. Now I'm just going to delete everything except for this general review text. So now when I create a new movie, it will show up as new movie and it will say general review and we'll also add it to our watch list. So I'm just going to click out into empty space here and then I can click on this drop down right here and hit new movie. And if I click that, it's going to automatically add a new movie to my database. I can change the name here, the name of the movie. Down here under general review, I can give my review and I can also fill out these things here, right? I can give a summary, add a genre, add some actors, a runtime, and so on. If I wanted to make this the default for the new page instead of an empty page, I could click on these three dots right here and then I could set as default. Now it's going to ask if I want to set this as the default for all views of movies. So I'm just for now going to select for all views in movies. This way, if there's any other views of this database in the future, it will automatically always use this new movie as the starting page. If I wanted to just set it for this particular view that we're looking at right now, I could also do that right here, but I want it to do it for all future views. So I'm just gonna hit for all views in movies. And that way, if I go to the media library and I start working on this view here, I can hit new and it will add new movie. I can open it up. And as you can see, it's starting us fresh with our general review. Now I'm gonna go back to my databases and movies. I'm also going to go ahead and delete the email and phone property. Next, let's talk about filtering databases. What if you only wanted to see specific database items based on some specifications with their properties? Well, that's what I'm going to show you how to do right now. So let's say that we added a review property. And to do this, I'm just going to add a select dropdown and we're gonna call it review. And here we can add some stars. So for the first one, I'm just gonna type in star emoji and we're gonna select one star, create. Then I'm just gonna copy this, command C and paste twice to create two star. So now we have one, two, three, four, and five star review. And what I can do here is just make the background all the same on these, go with yellow. And now I can go through and rate these different films. Now, in this case, I have reviews that are four stars and three stars. If I wanted to filter it so that I just see the four star reviews, I can go up here to filter and then I can select what I want to filter by. I don't see reviews in here, so I'm going to hit more. Then I'm going to scroll down until I see review, click on review, and then it's going to give me some basic options here. Out of the box, I can select review is, is not, is empty, or is not empty. So if the review was empty, there's nothing here. That's what this would be referring to. If the review is not empty, that would apply to all of these because all of these have something in review. And for the is not and is, we can check what we want them to be. So right now it's on review is, and I could select four stars. Now it's only going to show us the views with four stars. If I click out of this, I can now see that it's only showing me the reviews with four stars. And if I selected the three star and the four star, it would bring this one back in. If I turn four star off, it would only show me the three star. Next, let's imagine that I only wanted to see my reviews that are related to crime and that have four stars, right? This wouldn't work for this four star selection here because I have no way of saying that I want to filter by genre and review. But if you click on these three dots right here and then hit add to advanced filter, it's going to open up some filter rules. So now we can select where review is four stars. Then you can add a filter rule and, or you can do or, but in this case we want to do and, 
because we want it to apply to both of these things. So, and the genre is crime. So then it's only gonna show me any of the database items that we have where there's four stars and the genre is crime. Now I'm just going to remove these reviews here and let's imagine that I add another one in here. So let's add Goodfellas and Goodfellas is another crime genre. And I'm gonna make this one five stars. Then I'm going to go ahead and go to properties and I'm gonna bring back status. And let's say that I've already watched Goodfellas. And so if The Godfather was on my watch list, it likely wouldn't have a review. And same with La La Land. So let's just get a better example here. So now only the movies that I've watched would be reviewed. Another option here is adding a filter group. So let's say I wanted to filter by genre and let's go to add to advanced filter. And I can say genre is crime. And then I can add a filter group. And this is going to set it up so that I can add multiple conditions for the next filter. So I can do, for instance, where genre is crime and review is five stars. And then I can also add another filter rule in here where it says or review is empty. So now it's going to show me any spots where there's crime and the review is either empty or there's five stars. And if I were to change this review to two stars, it would disappear because it doesn't meet our filter conditions anymore. Now I'm just going to delete this filter now that you see how that works. Now that I've showed you how to filter out certain items from your database and eliminate things that you don't want to see and just isolate it down to the things that you do want to see, next I'm going to show you how to organize and sort your databases. Let's say that I have La La Land watched and now I have it rated at three stars. And let's imagine that we want to see movies sorted by review so that we can see our best movies first, the ones that we rated the highest and our least favorite movies last. So what we would do is just click sort, then I would open up more and click review. And now I can sort it ascending, which is going to start with the lowest and work its way up or I can change it to descending. To give you an idea of how this works is if I click into here, you'll notice that I have an order for these. If I change the order around, it's going to change the sorting. So it's not based on necessarily how many stars are in here, but it's based on the order of these different items within that select property that we created. So this is important to note. This can confuse you if you don't have these in the right order in here. But now that I have it set to review descending, it's going to put these in that specific order. Now let's imagine that we want drama to show up ahead of musical. So I'm gonna drag that there. And now we can also add another sort by clicking into our sort and hitting add sort. And here we could select genre and you could change whether that is ascending or descending and that will change as well. If you change the orders of these, it will also change your sorting to prioritize whatever is on top. So if genre is descending first, it's gonna look at genre and it's going to start at the bottom of the list and work its way up. And then after it looks at genre, it's gonna look at the next condition, which is the stars. So the next one would be crime. So since these two are both crime, they're gonna be next in the list based on our sort of genre descending. But then it's going to look and it's going to say, okay, we have two crime objects in this database. Which one goes first in the list? Well, it looks to the next sort, which is the review descending. So review descending says that the five star goes before the two star. You can continue to add sorts here, or you can close sorts out and remove them entirely. And that's how you sort your Notion database. Currently, Notion has six ways of viewing your data. There's tables, boards, timelines, calendars, lists, and galleries. And these are the six ways to view data in your Notion databases. Table is the one that most of us are familiar with, and it's the one that we've been using for this video to teach you about databases for the most part. Within a table, you can drag these properties around and you can add new properties by clicking the plus button right here. If you want to change this icon that's appearing next to the properties, you can click into the property right here and then you can click on the icon itself 
and Notion has a ton of icons that you can choose from. Tables feature a way to calculate different rows. So if we wanted to calculate the total number of minutes, for instance, out of all of our movies, when you add together the runtime, we could go to these three dots here, go to properties, pull up runtime minutes. I'm gonna add an arbitrary number here for Goodfellas. I don't know exactly how long it is. I'm just gonna take a random guess. And then you could hit calculate under here. And there's lots of different ways that you can calculate this number. We could average it, we could sum it. Actually, average might be an interesting way to see this information. So as you can see, the average runtime of these movies is 147.8 minutes. When you click calculate under certain properties, you're gonna get different options. So for the status property, it's going to allow us to count per group. So we could count everything in the to do, in progress or complete or we could count the percentage that are on our watch list or the percentage that are complete. So how many we've actually watched. So let's change it to complete. And as you can see, we've watched 80% of the movies in our list. And if I change these, they'll update dynamically. As you can see, it changed to 60 when I move this to my watch list or to watching currently. But if I change it back to watched, it's going to make that 80% complete. If you don't want it to calculate anything, you can just click on the calculate button and hit none. Like here, it's counting the total number of movies in our table. We could just click on this and change it to none. And now it won't say anything there. If we click on these three dots right here, and then we click on layout, we can change between the different layouts that we have available to us. But each layout has its own options. Some of the options that you can toggle for table are right here. So show vertical lines, I can turn that off. And as you can see, that toggles the vertical lines in our database. So if I turn that off, now there's no lines between these. But if I turn it on, you can see the lines reappear. There's also a master wrap all columns button so that you can wrap all of these columns or you can choose to have them not wrapped by default. And you can decide how you want to open pages. If you want to see them as a side peak, you can make that the default or we could change it to something like center peak so that if I click on these, it's gonna open it in the center of the screen. So right now we have movies table. And if I click on this and hit rename, it's also going to open up these three dots here, which is going to allow me to rename this. I'm just going to name it all movies. And then in parentheses, I'm gonna put sorted by review. And then I'm just going to click on this icon right here and we're gonna search star. And then I can put a star in there. And actually, let's get rid of the sorted by and just have it say by review. So now it's completely visible over here. And let's go ahead and add a sort and then type in review, hit enter, and we can change this back to review descending. So now our movies are sorted by review. Now let's use a board to group these movies by genre. To add a board view and keep this table view, you would just hit plus right here. And that's going to automatically create a new view. It's not going to look very formatted because now we pretty much have all of our properties coming back in, but soon we'll have this looking really nice. So let's change it to board and let's say all movies by genre. And then we can come in here and change the icon. And as you can see, we get some new options. So we have card preview now and card preview is just going to show us either the page content or the page cover of each of these items. So if we change it to page cover, most of these are going to be blank because there is no page cover. We change it to page content. As you can see, it's going to pull in the page content that we created earlier, or it'll pull in Goodfellas general review since that has the general review content. These ones that don't have any content within them, when I click on them, aren't going to pull up anything. I'm going to click back into here, go to layout, and we're actually going to change the card preview to none and I'm gonna change the card size to small. Now this is a bit more compact, which I prefer, and you can also color the columns. So you can color them based upon whatever these items are. So since these are all gray, the backgrounds of these will be gray. And again, you can open pages in side peak, center peak, or full page. If I wanna edit what these are grouped by in this board, I can go ahead and click this back button, go down to the group option, which we'll talk a bit more about later, and first of all, we can hide empty groups. So where there's no genre, we can just hide that all together. And here where it says group by, we can click on genre and we can change it to whatever we want to group by. 
So if we group by something like favorite, there's only gonna be two columns because we have two that are favorited and we have three that are not favorited. And now let's say we wanted to group by review. We could do that too. And once again, we could hide this by either clicking this eyeball right here or just hitting hide empty groups in general. Since there's no one stars, we're not seeing any one stars appearing in here. Let's change this back to group by genre and let's close this. So now if we add a new page from here, what it's going to do is it's going to add this property to it. So if we had a new drama movie that we wanted to add, we could hit plus and then we could open this up. And as you can see, the genre is automatically drama. One of the nice things about this view is you can also drag items between these and you can change the genre in that way as well. So now this should say science fiction because I just dragged it under science fiction. You can go ahead and click here to delete. And if you wanna see more properties related to these movies, you can click on these three dots right here, go to properties. And as I showed earlier with tables, you can actually select things like status and you can pull that in here. This is editable as well. So if I wanted to click on Goodfellas and add it to watching, I could do so. Same with La La Land here, I could add it to watch list if I haven't seen it yet. And you can even do the same sorting and filtering that you could do with tables. So if I did sort, the way that this would work is, let's say I wanted to sort by status, and I can change it to status ascending or status descending. And what that's going to do is if there's more than one item in crime, as you can see here, it's going to set it to ascending. So it's gonna start with the lowest item to do and work its way to the highest item, which is the complete item. So if I added another movie here in crime and I changed it to watched, as you can see, that's the order that would go down in. I can also change this to descending, just like I did it in the table. I'm just going to go ahead and remove this sort. And that's pretty much the board view. Now let's talk about the timeline view. The timeline view won't make any sense for this particular database. So I'm going to go back to where I started in my databases page. And if you remember right, we had a movies database and a books database. But now I'm going to add a new database called goals. And this is gonna help me show you how the timeline feature works. So I'm just gonna hit the slash command and I'm gonna start typing full page. I'm gonna hit enter when I see full page database. And I'm going to call this goals. We can create a name for our goal. And by default, we're looking at the table view. So I'm just going to create this in table view and then once I have it all set up properly, I'm going to view it as a timeline. So let's go ahead and right click to delete these tags and let's add a few goals. And I could continue adding goals here, but to show how the timeline works, I'm just going to hit the plus button and we're gonna click on date. So now we have a date property like I showed you earlier and we're gonna click into this and we're actually going to include an end date. So now we can add two dates. We can add a beginning and an end. So let's say we wanna read a new book. Uh, let's say between January 1st. So I'm gonna select the date here and click on first and the 20th. So that's our range. We wanna read a new book within these days here. And let's say we wanna start training and we wanna run a marathon. So I'm gonna add an end date for run marathon. And we're gonna select January 1st to March 31st. So we're gonna give ourselves three months for this goal. Gain 15 pounds of muscle, go all the way over to, let's say September. And then forget 100,000 subscribers. Let's go the first and set an end date and go all the way to the end of the year. Now that we have start dates and end dates, we can view this as a timeline. So let's just keep our table here and let's just call this view all goals. And I'm gonna go with the trophy icon. Then I'm going to click on the plus button and we're gonna select timeline. And let's go ahead and name this view timeline. And I wanna show the timeline by date. That's the only property that I can select. You can also enable show table and it will show in a table what your timeline looks like. You can drag this out if you want to. 
I'm gonna click back into these three dots, go to layout. And as you can see, you can also include table properties. Like I can add date here. And as you can see, it'll add that property there. So now I can view this as a table and I can see the timeline on the right side. And again, you can open pages how you wanna see them. So if you wanna see them as a side peak, you can keep that or you can change it to center or full. Now, the next thing with layout that you want to direct your attention to is this right here. So here I can select how I wanna view this. Right now, it's viewing it on a monthly basis, but if I click on this, I can change it to quarterly or yearly even. So for the goal view, I wanna view this yearly. So let's hit year. And as you can see, it's going to show us that read new book is going to be in this part of the year and it's gonna show us where we're currently at with this red marker. And I can also see that we have run a marathon, gain 15 pounds of muscle and get 100,000 subscribers, our most long-term goal. If I hold shift on my keyboard and I use the scroll wheel, I can scroll throughout this if I'm hovered over top of this database. So I can see how far out these go one of the other neat things about the timeline view is you can actually set up dependencies within this view. So you can see something that needs to happen before you can start something else. Let's imagine that we wanna train for this marathon before we partake in it. So what I could do is I could drag out run a marathon and it will show me the dates as I scroll throughout the timeline. Let's move it to the end of January for starting running the marathon. And before that, let's add a dependent task by hitting new. Let's just write train for marathon. And I'm going to click right here in this empty spot and add an end date. And by default, it's just going to make that January 4th to January 4th. But if I wanted to, I could just go the 20th and then I can drag this to tweak it. So let's just drag this out so that it makes sense. And let's drag it up top here above run marathon. Now, if I click on these three dots up here, and I go to dependencies. Now I can add two new properties to my database, which is blocking and blocked by. The blocking property is going to show me what this task is blocking. And the blocked by property is going to show me what it's blocked by. So with this setup, the training for marathon should be blocking run a marathon and blocked by on run a marathon should be trained for a marathon. So let's hit create and I'll show you how this works. So in the timeline view, I can just drag from train for marathon to the beginning of run a marathon. So let's click on these three dots now, go to layout, table properties, and let's turn on blocked by and blocking. Now, as you can see, train for marathon is blocking run a marathon and run a marathon is blocked by train for a marathon. Let's just reorder these so that they make a bit more sense. So now we know that we need to complete this training for the marathon before we can run a marathon. Let's go back to our all goals view and let's add another property. I'm gonna add a status so that we can add not started in progress and done. And let's move it here. So now all of these are not started, but let's say run a marathon is in progress. And let's go back to our timeline. If I wanted to see what the status of our tasks were, I could enable them in this table right here or I could click on these three dots. I could go to properties. And if I go into properties here, I can turn on status and that's going to show it to me right next to said task. Now I can't change this by clicking on it from here, but I can open up these specific pages by clicking on them. And then I can change the status of the goal here. There's also this hide table option. So if I don't wanna see the table, I can always do that. And then again, I can hold shift and scroll my scroll wheel. I can always open my table by clicking on these arrows right here. This table isn't to be confused with the original goals table. This is just a timeline feature that allows you to see your table in a specific way. And again, if you wanna edit that, you can click on these three dots, go into layout, and the table settings are here. So if I wanna turn the table off entirely, I could, or I could select properties that I wanna see specifically right here. The next view that we're going to talk about is calendar view. And for calendar view, we're going to create a new database. I'm back here on our databases page and I'm just going to hit slash. I'm going to type in full page database, hit enter, and we're going to call this actions. So this is going to be a list of all of our projects and tasks. Let's just change the name here to action. So it'll basically be a list of the daily actions that we're going to be taking. 
You can think of this as a task manager or a to-do list. Then I'm going to delete tags and we're gonna add some actions in here. Now we need to add a date property. So I'm gonna hit the plus button and we're gonna click date. This could be a due date so that we can see when these specific actions are due. And then I can come in here and I can add a date that this is due. So let's say the 7th, 13th, and the 20th. Let's also go ahead and add a checkbox property and let's just call this complete. So now we can check things off as they get completed. Next, let's go ahead and change this view by clicking on these three dots here, going to layout and clicking on calendar. Now we're going to see everything appearing in our calendar view. If you're not seeing things showing up here, it's because your tasks don't have a date property. So you do need this due date here for them to show up. I'm gonna click on these three dots and go into the layout. Here I can select what I'm showing the calendar by. So if you have multiple date properties for your tasks, you can show by specific dates. Right now I'm showing by due date. Again, you can open pages however you wanna open them, side peak, center peak, or full page. Let's go back. And now we're going to enable the property of complete. So as you can see, you can also enable properties on your calendar so that you can see what's complete and what's not complete. One of the ways that I like to use filtering within the calendar is to hide tasks that are already completed. So let's say film databases YouTube video is complete. I would check that off. And as you can see right now, it doesn't disappear. But if I hit filter, I can actually make all the complete tasks disappear by hitting complete and complete is unchecked. So now it's going to show me any place where complete is unchecked. And if I check these off, they disappear from my calendar. Next, we're gonna look at the list view. And the list view is one of the cleanest ways to see your data in Notion. So let's imagine that we had that example that I just showed where a lot of these tasks are complete. Let's say these two are complete and we add a filter of where complete is unchecked. So now it's only showing us where the items are unchecked. So we could rename this view here to to-do list calendar. And then we could hit the plus button here and we could open up the list view. The list view only has one option here, open pages in. So we can decide how you wanna open the pages and then hit done. You can also decide which properties you want to see. So you can see complete or you can just see due date, but let's keep them both on just so you can see what that looks like. As you can see, we have a due date down here. You can click on it to change it. You can click to toggle your completion. And one thing that the list view is really good at is creating an archive. So if I click and rename this, I can call this archive. So these are all the tasks that I've completed. So let's go ahead and add a check icon. And then let's go ahead and filter this list view to complete is checked. So at this point, now we can see our archive of all of our completed tasks in a nice list. And we can go back to our to-do list calendar and we can see what's not complete. If we complete something over here, it'll get moved into our list view that's set up to be filtered to only show tasks that are checked with complete. I'm sure you can come up with other ways to use the list view, but this is one of the simplest views and it can work really well for things like an archive. Finally, let's look at the gallery view. This makes it super appealing to look at all of your database items. For this view, you're gonna find me back in our databases and I'm going to go to our movies database from earlier in this video. Here, I'm going to hit the plus button to create a new view and we're going to click on gallery. Now, as you can see, this has some similar features to the board view that we talked about earlier. So I can change the card preview and let's go with page cover. By default, we don't have any page covers in here, so we're not going to have anything. Let's change the card size to small. I prefer small usually with this. And then let's just call this our movie shelf. And in parentheses, let's put by review. Now I'm going to go to properties and I'm going to turn on genre and I'm also going to turn on review. And as you can see, it's gonna show us the review for each of these. It's going to show us the genre and it has the title, but there's this big empty space here. And if you have that, it's because you just haven't filled out your page cover yet. 
and your card preview is set to page cover. I can also change this to none and it will just give me this very basic view here, which I like quite a bit. But if we wanted to see this with some nice images, we can change it back to page cover. And then we can click into these individual pages and we can add a cover. From here, I can hit change cover and we can go to unsplash. And then I could type something in like gangster for Godfather. And then we can reposition it by hitting reposition and dragging it and then hit save position. And then once I click out of this, you'll notice that we now have an image here. You can also hit reposition here and you can move it around so that it makes sense. Now I'm going to duplicate these steps with these other movies and you can upload, you can go with one of the defaults in Notion, you can link to an image or you can just go to unsplash. All right, now these are looking quite nice and that is a good example of how to use the gallery view. Now we're getting to the point where I'm going to start talking about formulas, relations, and rollups. But before I do that, I wanted to first dive a little bit deeper into some of the settings that you can toggle within your database. As I've referenced a few times, you can always click on these three dots to edit most of your database settings. One of the things that I like to turn on once I have completed work on my database is the lock database button. If I hit lock database, it's still going to allow me to add new items to the database, but it's not going to allow me to come in here and change things like the properties that are in view. As you can see, these are grayed out and it's not letting me change these settings. So it's good to lock your databases after you're done doing any major edits. You can also copy link to view. So if I hit copy link to view, it's going to allow me to copy this specific view here, movie shelf, and then I can go back to databases and let's actually go back to our media library instead. And if I hit command V to paste, I can then hit create linked view of database. Then it's going to pull in this movie shelf view. If I wanna toggle this title here, I can click on these three dots and hit hide database title. And now we have our movie shelf on our media library. And I actually like that a lot better than our movies table. So I'm just going to delete that I'm also going to go ahead and delete books. And now our media library is just a nice list of our movies in the form of a shelf. Let's go ahead and lock views. Here in the settings, you can also change the load limit from 10 pages all the way up to 100 pages. So if you have a ton of pages in here, it's just going to load X amount of pages. And then you can open more, there will be a button at the bottom. You can also click on these three dots to duplicate your view. And that's going to just create the same view so now we have two versions of this view up here. So if you kind of like the general direction of this, but maybe you want to see instead of by review, maybe you want to see a little bit of a different view here. Let's just rename this to favorites, hit enter, and then filter by favorite is checked. Now it's just going to show us our favorites because if you remember right, we turned on favorite here. So it might actually be good to go into this here, go to properties and turn on favorite. So that way we can see that these are checked with favorite and we can also take them out of our favorites quite easily by clicking on that favorite icon and they'll still be in our movie shelf. We can always go back and add them to our favorite and then they'll appear in that favorites list. Then of course there's a delete view button which just goes ahead and deletes this entire view. One more thing that I would like to talk about before we get into the advanced property types that I promised you we would get into later in this video is database grouping. We talked a bit about this when we were looking at board view, but the truth is, is you can actually add grouping within most of the views in Notion. However, there are a few exceptions for some of the views that can't use grouping. I'm gonna go to my movie shelf, and then we're gonna click on these three dots here. And as you can see, there's this group option. So if I hit group, it's going to allow me to group by some different settings here. So let's just group by genre. And as you can see in the gallery view, this is what grouping looks like. It puts all of our crime here and I can toggle this open and closed. I can also close this one here and this one and this one. And I could go ahead and hide the empty one. So this is an interesting way of seeing our movie shelf as well. 
And you can always come in here and edit the group settings just by going to group and you can change what you're grouping by. You can hide empty groups as I showed you earlier and you can hide specific groups here. Down here, it'll show you the hidden groups and you can bring them back into view if you'd like. If you wanna get rid of grouping, just hit remove grouping. As you can see here, this is our board view. So in the board view, by default, grouping is turned on. If I click on these three dots here, I can also add a subgroup within a board. So if I hit subgroup, it's going to create a swim lane based on reviews, if I hit review. So now this thing looks pretty complex, but there may be some ways that you can use this. So I'm just going to hide no review. And as you can see, now I can toggle these open or closed, and I can see these based upon one, which genre they're in, and two, what the review status is. So this is kind of an interesting way of seeing your data. The grouping option is available in every view except for calendar. And some of the views don't allow for subgroups while some do. I suggest you just play around with grouping and see if it makes sense for you. Next, I'm going to show you some examples of how you can use formulas in Notion. Let's imagine that we wanted to see our runtime minutes as runtime hours. To do that, we could just hit the plus button here, go to formula, and let's just call this runtime hours. And click into empty space. And now we can enter a formula here that's going to convert these minutes into hours. So let's just click here, and then we're gonna find runtime minutes so that we can reference it. And then you can simply hit the slash button to divide and type in 60. And then you can hit done. Now, as you can see, it's turned these into hours instead of minutes. If you don't wanna see all of these numbers, you can click into here and you can surround this with a round. So I can put a parenthesis there, put a parenthesis at the end. It's going to round it for me. And as you can see, these ones all rounded down to two and this one rounded up to three. Now let's imagine on our movie shelf, we wanted to see a heart next to the movies that we favorited. So instead of this default little checkbox here that shows up, we would just wanna see a little heart show up here. You can actually get this to work with formulas. So I'm gonna go back to my table here, hit the plus button and click on formula. We're going to type in favorite symbol and then I'm just going to click into empty space and we're going to create an if operator. So if I type in if, it's going to show me an example down here and it's going to give me the syntax. So we need to enter a Boolean and then we need to enter a value if the Boolean is true and a value if that Boolean is false. So I'm going to type if and we're going to find the favorite checkbox and then we're going to add equals. We're gonna put two equal signs because this is how we say if favorite equals we're gonna type in true, and you're gonna click on this constant here. So we're saying if the checkbox is checked, that's what true stands for, comma, then we're going to add a heart emoji, and we're going to put quotation marks around that. Then we're gonna put a comma, and we're gonna enter a blank space for if it's not true. So what, again, this is saying if the property favorite is equal to true, then we're gonna put a heart. And if it's not equal to true, then we're going to put a blank space. Then I'm just going to put some parentheses to close this off and hit done. And now, as you can see, the two items that we favorited have a heart and I can go over to my movie shelf of favorites now, and we could just select this button right here, go to properties and get rid of favorite and just put in the favorite symbol. So now if something's favorited, it's going to have that little heart next to it. And in our movie shelf, we can also go ahead and add the property of favorite symbol. And now if I click on any of these and I uncheck this option, as you can see, the heart will disappear and we can make it reappear on certain items as well. And if you remember right, we filtered this to only show our favorites. So now this looks quite nice. For this next example, let's say that I wanted to figure out how many days are between today and the end of my goal. So we have our goals database here and what we're going to need to do first is we're going to need to define what today is. So in order to do that, we're going to use a very simple formula. So I'm just gonna hit plus and I'm gonna go to formula and then I'm going to call this formula now. 
within the now formula, I can just type in now, and then I can click on that function that appears and I can close that off and hit done. And now it's just going to return the exact time and date that it is right now. And this will update as this time and date changes. Then we're going to create another simple formula by hitting the plus button, going to formula, and we're gonna call this end. So this one is going to pull the end from this date property. And in order to do that, we're just gonna type in end, and this is going to pull up a function, and we're going to then go ahead and start typing in date. So then I'm gonna click on this date property. Now I'm gonna close that off and hit done. So now we have the end dates and now. So from here, we can add one more formula that figures out the time between now and end so that we have something that updates dynamically based on if we change these dates like I just did there or when now changes like it has over the past two minutes. So let's hit the plus button, go to formula, and this one is going to be days remaining. Let's just drag this between now and end because I feel like that makes the most sense. And then in here, we're just going to click and we're gonna type concat, which is short for concatenate. Concatenate means like basically connect two things together. So within that concatenate function, we're just going to type in format and we're going to type in date between. Date between is another function that we're going to call to figure out how many days are between now and end. So I'm gonna hit date between, then I'm going to type end and make sure not to click on the function, but the property end. So we just asked it how many days are between end, then we're gonna do comma, and I'm going to type in now. And again, make sure you hit on the property now, not the function. And then we're going to tell it what we want it to figure out. So we want it to figure out days. So in this case, we're gonna hit comma, and we're gonna type out days, and we're gonna space that out. And then I'm going to add some parentheses at the end here. Now to finish off this concatenate function, we're just going to hit plus and we're gonna type out days left. Then we're going to close that off. Now we have it where it's saying 16 days left, which looks amazing. And since there isn't a space in here, we can go to where it says days, right before days and add a space. And now we can hit done. And now we have this beautiful formula that brought together two other formulas to create how many days we have left. So I'm going to go ahead and hide in view for end and now we don't need those anymore. And now we just have this nice formula that just says days left. So we can keep that there. We can hide these blocked, blocking and blocked by. And now we just have this nice formula in the forefront that tells us automatically how many days we have left and it updates dynamically. So those are just a few formulas to get you started with Notion. And oftentimes, if you have a problem, you can search on the Notion subreddit or post your problem there. And usually there will be somebody that can help you out. The more that you research formulas and use them in your own workspace, the better you'll get with them. Next, I'm going to cover relations and rollups. Relations and rollups allow you to connect two Notion database items together. For example, let's imagine that we have some goals here and we wanna connect them to our actions database. I'm going to add a new view in our action database that just gives me a table showing all of our actions. Now I'm going to open up the sidebar here and we're going to create a new page. I'm just gonna call it task management. I'm gonna make this a full width page and within this, I'm just going to create some linked databases. So I'm gonna hit slash create and we're gonna create a linked view of database like we did earlier in this tutorial. Now it's going to allow me to choose from my data sources. I'm just going to select goals and then I'm going to click out of this. Now I'm going to click into some empty space and I'm going to hit the slash button and I'm going to type in create and we're gonna hit enter on linked view of database once again. Now we're going to pull in our actions. We're going to select the table view so now I can see our goals and our actions all on one page. I can even drag them side by side if I hit slash and type in column, and then I click on two columns. Now we have two columns here, and I can drag goals to one side of this, and we can drag actions to the other. And you can drag between them, and, and you can make it a 50-50 split, or you can make it an 80-20 split if you wanted to. 
for me, I'm just gonna click on these three dots here. I'm gonna go to layout and we're gonna change it to a gallery layout. Then I'm going to go to card size and I'm going to make these small. We're gonna set the card preview to none. Let's move this over a bit more and let's just go ahead and hide this goals title and also hide the actions title. Now we're viewing these databases in a unique way. We've brought them both into the same page and now I wanna connect them together, right? We wanna have a goal that's related to an action. In order to do this, we're going to have to create a relation within the action database. So let's rename this table here to actions and then let's go ahead and hit plus and go to relation. Now I'm going to select our goals database and here it says related to goals because I selected our goals database. The name of the property is goals. I'm going to change it to related goal and we're going to limit it to one page, meaning it's only going to allow me to select one goal per action. So we can only have one goal that's related to each action. Now I'm also going to select show on goals so that not only will my goals show up next to my action that they're related to, but my actions are also going to show up in the goals database when I click into one of these goals. Let's hit add relation and let's change where it says related property on goals to related actions and then hit update relation. Now it's as simple as clicking into this related goal and then I can select a goal that these actions are related to. So maybe I'll add an action of run five miles. Here I could add a due date and I could select a related goal of train for marathon. So now we have an action of run five miles that's related to the goal of training for a marathon. So let's click on train for marathon. And as you can see, we now have this related actions property. I'm going to click on the six dots next to it. And then I'm going to hit show as page section. Now I can see it as a special page section here. And I'm going to be able to see all of the actions that are related to this specific goal. Let's go ahead and hide the rest of these properties so that they're not getting in the way. I'm going to leave days remaining and date, but we're going to get rid of some of these others just by hiding them quickly. And we'll also leave status at not started, but let's make it in progress since we're actually working on some of these things now. And as you can see, now we have these two related here in the actions database. We can see train for marathon is the related goal to this action. And if we click on train for marathon, we can see all of our tasks for that linked right here. I can even hit this new page in related action button and I can type in run 10 miles. Then I can open this task up, add in a due date. And if I zoom back out here, you'll see that that's now added a task in our actions database. If I go back to our databases view and I go to goals, you'll also see that if I click into train for marathon, this is still here, right? We can still see related actions. And if I go back to databases and into our actions database, I can see that these are related to that goal of training for a marathon. You can imagine that there are so many other ways to connect databases in Notion. Now let's talk about the rollup property. The rollup property is basically a feature of the relation property. Let me show you what I mean. So here in our actions table, we can see that our goal here that's related is training for the marathon. But what if we wanted to see some more information about training for the marathon on our action page? What if we wanted to see how many days there are left in this related goal? Well, we could add a roll up that pulls in how many days are left for training for our marathon. So what we do is just hit plus and hit roll up. Here we're going to select the relation. So if we click on the select button, it's only going to show us any relations that this actions database has. And since related goal is the only relation in here, we can click on that. Now by default, it's just going to put the train for marathon in here twice. But if I go to property here, I can select a property from our goals database. And if you remember right, we created a days remaining formula there. So if I click days remaining, now I can see that we have 28 days left total to train for the marathon. I'm just going to go ahead and rename this to days left for goal. So that's basically how rollups work. 
it allows us to pull another property from this related page. Now, the thing is, is we can click into here and we can remove our goal and we could add a new one. Let's say read a new book is the goal that we were relating to. And it will actually change how many days we have left because this goal has a different amount of days left than this goal does. However, if you click on days left, you can't edit days left at this point. The only way that you can edit days left or edit a roll up is by actually going into the page itself that has that property. So I could hit read a new book. That's going to open that up. And now we can change days remaining by changing the overall deadline. And as you can see, it updates here. So that's how relations and rollups work. Now I'm going to talk about how to add sub items in Notion. Similar to dependencies, sub items create a relation within a single database. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Basically in actions, if we wanted to create sub items underneath any of these, we could do so. So let's say we have a new task in here and let's say it is read X book. So it could just be a book that we're reading. And we're going to relate that to read a new book as our goal. And as you can see, this is now pulling in our days left for reading a new book. And let's say we wanted to break this task down even further. And we wanted to have sub items underneath it, like, you know, read chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and so on. In order to do that, you could go up to these three dots here, click sub items, and then we need to go ahead and create the sub item name. So we're just going to call it sub task. And for the parent item, we're just going to name it task. Now I'm going to hit create. And as you can see, it bumped all of these out. And if you hover over them now, you can click this little drop down and you can add a new sub item. So for read X book, I'm just going to click the plus button. And as you can see, we now have sub task and task getting populated from this new sub item. So I'm just gonna say read chapter one. We're gonna add another new sub item, read chapter two, another, and I could go on and on with this. As you can see, the parent task on all of these is read X book, and then read X book has multiple subtasks within it, reading all of these different chapters. Now, if I click the plus button and I click roll up, I can now select these other types of relations that are happening within this same page. So if I just wanted to roll up the number of subtasks within a task, I could go subtask, and then we could go ahead and calculate and count all. So now what that's doing is it's pulling up a number for this because we've enabled count all for how many subtasks are within this task. And we could rename this to subtask count. And if we add subtasks to any of these others, that would also start to add a subtask count for these. So that's essentially how you use relations and rollups. And that's also a mini guide on sub items and dependencies. If you want more help with sub items and dependencies, you can check out the video in the upper right hand corner right about now. This video took quite a while for me to make. So please like this video, subscribe down below if you want to see more videos like this. Hit the bell icon if you want to be notified and comment if you have any feedback or you have any questions. I'm happy to help. Oh, and by the way, if this video didn't help you, check out my playlist of 60 plus educational free pieces of content on how to use Notion. All right, we'll see you in the next one.